Welcome back to another episode of What's in the Night Sky, sponsored by Squarespace. And it's the first episode of 2022, which also means it's the start of the fifth year of Wittens. Like, <laughs> has it been that long? That's crazy. But thank you guys for sticking around, making this series amazing. But coming up this month, we have an update on Comet Leonard, who's been putting on quite a show lately. We have the best meteor shower of the year, possibly, with the quadranted meteor shower. There are three evening planets to look forward to. We also have some good action with the Cygnus region of the Milky Way. And we'll also talk about some targets in the Orion constellation for those of you with star trackers or equatorial mounts. But let's start with a summary of the Northern and Southern Hemisphere night skies. So starting in the Northern Hemisphere, facing north towards the circumpolar constellations in the evening skies, you'll notice Ursa Major very low in the north-northeast, but it will climb higher into the northeast as the night goes on. Draco the dragon snaking laterally, if that makes sense, to the northern horizon, and Ursa Minor also in a very low position. You'll also notice the bright star Vega from the constellation Lyra in the northwest, and just to the west of Lyra is Cygnus the Swan. And if I just turn off the effect of the moonlight, you'll notice that there's a really bright fuzzy region of the Milky Way that runs through the constellation Cygnus. This is known as the Cygnus region of the Milky Way. It's one of my favorite regions. So in the evening skies in the northwest, and as the night goes on, sinks down and sets in the north. And then you're left with the Cassiopeia region of the Milky Way, but this is a very faint region of the Milky Way. But the bright stars of Cassiopeia make up for that, especially if you're using a star glow filter. And just to the west of Cassiopeia, you'll find Andromeda, the spiral galaxy, nice and low on the horizon now. And that will show up even in your wide angle images. Coming back to the evening skies and facing west, right at the start of the month, you should be able to spot four planets if you've got a nice clear view of the horizon. So there's Venus, Mercury, Saturn, and Jupiter, all in the west in the evening skies. But as the month goes on day by day, Venus will sink closer to the sun and become lost in the evening twilight. As Mercury climbs higher and closer to Saturn, and then on the 7th of the month is when Mercury reaches greatest eastern elongation. That's the furthest it will be from the sun in the sky for this apparition. And then as the month continues, both Mercury and Saturn sink closer to the sun and become lost in the evening twilight. And by the end of the month, we have Jupiter as the only planet in the western skies in the evening. Again, coming back to the evening skies, this time facing south, and pretty much as darkness falls, you have the full winter circle or winter hexagon asterism of stars in the night sky. So you have Rigel from the constellation Orion, Sirius from Canis Major, Procyon from Canis Minor, Castor and Pollux of Gemini, Capella from Auriga, and Aldebaran from Taurus, all making a giant hexagon or circle in the night sky. And as the night goes on, the winter constellations cross high into the southern skies and you have a faint region of the Milky Way running through which you'd be able to see if the moon wasn't in the sky. And as the night goes on, the winter constellations make their way down to the southwest and the western horizon. As we approach the pre-dawn hours in the early morning, you'll notice that the Cygnus region has now swung around and is now rising in the northeast. So another opportunity to photograph the Cygnus region of the Milky Way, quite parallel to the northeastern horizon now. And you'll also notice towards the very end of the month, Venus and Mars rising in the southeast in the pre-dawn hours. So Venus has now passed into the morning skies to join Mars. Next month, they'll also be joined by Mercury as well. Onto the southern hemisphere and facing south towards the circumpolar constellations in the evening skies, you'll notice that the, the large and small Magellanic clouds start the night very high, but they come down 
into the southwest as the night goes on. And you'll also see the Crux constellation and Carina with the Carina Nebula low in the southeast and that rising higher and higher into the southeast as the evening goes on. But if I just swing to the east and zoom out a little bit, you'll notice that in the evening, if the moon wasn't in the sky, you'd have a nice opportunity for a Milky Way arch with the Crux and Carina regions of the Milky Way in the southeast and arching over to the southern summer constellations of Gemini, Auriga, Taurus, Orion, Canis Major and Canis Minor. And this is a very faint region of the Milky Way as well. But these beautiful bright stars more than make up for the lacklustre Milky Way. If we just swing a bit more to the north, so by the middle of the night, the southern summer constellations pretty much crossing the northern meridian, the highest point they'll reach in the sky. And as the night goes on, they'll sink down into the northwest. Now for those of you that are very early risers, or you've stayed out all night, there's another opportunity for a Milky Way arch. If I just turn off all these constellations. So there you can see much better now, the Milky Way arching over the southwest. And you also have the large and small Magellanic clouds underneath the arch. Coming back to the evening skies and facing west, very difficult to see Venus from the southern hemisphere, but you can easily spot Mercury, Saturn and Jupiter in the evening skies. As the month goes by, night by night, you'll notice Mercury climbing higher and closer to Saturn, reaches greatest eastern elongation on the 7th, so that's when it's furthest away from the sun in the sky. And as the month continues, Mercury and Saturn sink down closer to the sun and become lost in the evening twilight. And we're left with just Jupiter at the end of the month being the only evening planet. And facing east in the morning skies, towards the end of the month, you'll find Mars and Venus. So Venus has passed into the morning skies by the end of the month and joins Mars. As for conjunctions and close approaches this month, at the very beginning of the month, a waxing crescent moon passes by Mercury on the 3rd, on the 4th it passes by Saturn, and then on the 5th closer to Jupiter, and that's in the southwest evening skies. Then right at the end of the month, on the 29th, a waning crescent moon joins Mars and Venus in the eastern morning skies. New moon this month is on the 2nd, so any photographs you want to take in dark skies should be done at the start of the month. And then full moon is on the 17th, and it was known to the Native American tribes as the wolf moon because the hungry wolves would be howling into the sky at this time of year. Before we dive into the special events this month, a quick message from the sponsors of today's video, Squarespace. Squarespace is the place to host your website, online store, gallery, blog, or if like me, all of the above, because my website has been with Squarespace for years now and I use it for all of those things. The online store is amazing, everything is automated, it's where I sell my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets, and it means I can spend more of my time doing creative things like taking photographs and making videos. If you'd like to try Squarespace, head on over to squarespace.com forward slash Allen. You can start with one of their award-winning templates, customize it to your heart's content, and then when you're happy and you want your website to go live, Use the code Allen at the checkout for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain name with Squarespace. So Comet Leonard was the best comet of 2021, and it's been brightening quite significantly towards the end of December, and it still hasn't reached perihelion, which is its closest approach to sun. That happens on January the 3rd, and this is normally when comets will be at their brightest, but of course comets are very difficult to predict and don't always follow the rules. But Comet Leonard has started to show quite a long tail, which has also undergone a disconnection event where there is a separation in the gas tail caused by the solar wind. And you can see it here in this image captured beautifully by Sebastian Voltmer with a 135 millimeter lens. 
And then in much greater detail in this incredible image posted to the Space Weather Gallery by Gerald Raymond from astrostudio.at. Absolutely stunning image. So fingers crossed that it continues to brighten towards perihelion and um, there's only one way to find out and that's to continue observing and wait and see. So here is a map showing the position for Comet Leonard during January and it no longer moves so much relative to the backdrop of stars night by night. So this is pretty much the rough position it will be in for the next few weeks for the Northern Hemisphere uh, and then it will start to become lost in the evening twilight. It's already pretty difficult, if not impossible, to photograph from mid to high northern latitudes. So, you know, from the UK and northern Europe upwards. I mean, I was in the UK last week and I couldn't even glimpse Comet Leonard through the twilight. And we have perfectly clear skies all the way down to the horizon. So if you're about 50 degrees north in latitude or even more northward, um, you're probably not going to be able to see Comet Leonard again, but maybe you can catch some of the long tail sticking up from the horizon if you're in a very dark sky location. Now those of you in the Southern Hemisphere have a chance to see it for a much longer period of time, so if it does stay bright and visible, you will get an extended view and even possibly into February, but let's wait and see what happens. Now the year starts with one of the best meteor showers of the year and given the moon phase for all of the meteor showers this year it might very well be the best meteor shower of the year and that is the Quadrantids. Now the Quadrantids are named after a constellation which no longer exists, Quadrans Muralis. It was emitted by the International Astronomical Union back when they standardized the 88 constellations in 1922. But the name of the meteor shower has remained. So the radiant point lies at the northern tip of the constellation Bootes, and that's not far from the handle of the Big Dipper. The exact radiant has a declination of plus 60 degrees, so that highly positive declination tells us that it's a meteor shower that very much favours the northern hemisphere, because it's very close to the, the north celestial pole in the celestial sphere, or in the, the sky dome, let's say. If you are in the southern hemisphere, at least you know, close to the equator, you'd be wise to aim north if you wanted to see if you can try and catch some quadranted meteors. Now, you may spot a quadranted any time between December the 26th to January the 16th, but the peak of the meteor shower falls around the 3rd of January. The interesting thing about the quadrantids is that the peak is very short-lived. It only lasts a few to several hours, so you have to have a little bit of luck that you're on the night side of Earth when it does peak. So for example, um, the peak might be visible in Europe, but then those of you in USA will be in daylight, and by the time it gets dark in the USA, the peak might be over. So that's just an example, that's not a prediction for this year, because these things are very difficult to predict. The American Meteor Society predicts that the peak will fall on the night of the second into the morning of the third, in America, but then the International Meteor Society predicts that the peak will be on the night of the 3rd uh, for those of us in Europe. So <laughs> they're very difficult to predict and you just need to have a bit of luck that the peak happens when it's night time for you. So bottom line, if you have clear skies on the 2nd or the 3rd or maybe even the 4th, just get out and try your luck and hopefully you catch the peak. Now, during the few or several hours of the peak, you can expect rates of up to 120 meteors per hour, which is one of the highest rates for all of the meteor showers throughout the year. And also, this year, there'll be no moon in the sky, so viewing conditions are pretty much perfect. So get out there, try your luck, and cross everything that the peak happens for you when you've got clear skies and it's nighttime. Now, I think I'm going to start a new segment in Witten's where I talk about some beginner targets for star trackers and uh, deep sky objects. So this month I thought it would be a good idea to start with the constellation Orion. So in the northern hemisphere, Orion starts the night in the southeast, rises to its highest position in the south, which is the best viewing conditions, and then sinks down to the southwest in the early morning. For those in the southern hemisphere, it starts the night in the southeast, rises high into the northern skies, which is the best time to photograph it, and then sinks down to the western horizon. So here is the entire constellation captured with a 50mm lens on a full-frame camera. 
And if you have a longer telephoto lens or a telescope, you can hone in on targets such as the Orion Nebula, the Flame and Horsehead Nebula, and the Faint Witch's Head Nebula as well. I also have a vlog where I captured all of these images that you see on the screen, so do go and check that out for some tips and inspiration. And that's all I have for you this month, guys. I want to wish you all a very happy new year. I hope you all have an amazing 2022. And now onto the hashtag Wittens. For those of you that are new here, every month I set a target subject or theme for people to photograph and then upload their images to social media using the hashtag Wittens for a chance to win a prize. Third place wins a copy of my Astro Workflow Lightroom presets. Second place wins a What's in the Night Sky t-shirt. And first place wins a Photo View Photography Guidebook of their choice. Last month's theme was, of course, Comet Leonard. And we had some absolutely amazing images. But in third place was Mr. Jack Dog. This beautiful image of Comet Leonard passing by the Whale and Hockey Stick Galaxies. Thought this was a really amazing opportunity and captured very, very well. In second place was this serene winter scene from the Chief of Kamchatka in Alberta, Canada. Absolutely love this image. Very nicely composed. The comet looks great. Beautiful blue tones, but I love that warm light inside that hut there. It just really makes you want to get inside in the warmth and out of the winter cold. But absolutely love this image. Beautifully composed, and it's just something that you'd you'd hang on the wall. And then in first place was this image from Whale Omar in Cairo, Egypt. A stunning image captured from a distance of the three great pyramids of Giza, along with Venus and, of course, Comet Leonard. The image is technically a composite as the three main subjects were captured with different cameras and lenses, but the resulting image is just stunning, so well done to Whale. This month, Siemens, it's visible from both the northern and southern hemispheres, and it's the subject of the Star Tracker segment of this month's video. Let's go with Orion. So, whether that's a wide angle image of the landscape or some sort of deep sky image with a star tracker, just uh, let's see what you got. So, thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of What's in the Night Sky. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already and you don't want to miss out on these videos. And if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies. <laughs>